So good morning, everyone, and good extra early morning for anyone like me who is in the North American time. Uh, this work is a metamorphic spin-off based on data collected by Eve Goslin, master's student in my group, who is looking at the uh, characterization and tectonic implications of a late Grenville and shear zone. She collected a fantastic sample for titanite petro petrochronology along the way, which also provided an opportunity to test the zirconium and titanite thermometer at low temperature. This was outside the scope of her project, and she's busy with uh, writing this semester. So that's why I'm uh, presenting, and she's first author. Titanite is a uh, powerful mineral that is increasingly used uh, to date ductile deformation, as uh, we've seen yesterday. It is particularly useful to link time and temperature because it can be used both as a uranium lead petrochronometer and a th as a thermometer. The calibration of the zirconium and titanite thermometer was performed by Hayden et al. over a range of 600 to 1000 degrees Celsius. But what about the titanite that formed at lower temperature? Would it contain low zirconium content as predicted if we extrapolate this calibration to lower temperature? Let's test that with uh, syntectonic titanite from a shear zone in the Grenville province. Very briefly, the Grenville province in Canada is the result of a major continent-continent collision. The shear zone of interest is the Saint-François-de-Salles shear zone in central Grenville, which is a several kilometer wide, tens of kilometer long, anastomose sinistral sense deformation corridor that affects mainly Grenvillian age plutonic rocks. The studied outcrop is composed of approximately 1075 MA mangerite that contains a weak metamorphic foliation. There are several bands of myelinite that crosscuts the uh, metamorphic foliation. As you can see on the right, there are some beautiful CS fabrics and uh, quartz ribbons. There are also thin layers of ultramyelinite, such as the black layer on the two photos, that are subparallel to the myelinites and that also crosscut and deflect the metamorphic foliation. The perfect glacial polish gives perfect observation surfaces, but it's also perfectly impossible to sample with a hammer and a chisel, so we use a rock saw. The sample ultramyelinite is located a dozen meters away from the myelinite that I showed on the previous slide. It's a subvertical, a few millimeter thick, and shear sense indicators at the edges are consistent with sinistral slip, just like what we see in the adjacent myelinite. At the microscopic scale, Parts on the sides of the ultramyelinite exhibit dynamic recrystallization through subgrain rotation, while plagioclase exhibits kinked albite twins and undulous extinction. K feldspar porphyr class in the ultramyelinite commonly show flame perthite and rare fractures with incipient bulging recrystallization. So, overall, these microstructures are consistent with the relatively low temperature of deformation probably in the range of 400 to 500 degrees Celsius. Pressure is also a parameter in the equation of the zirconium and titanite thermometer. Unfortunately, it's much more difficult to constrain the pressure during the formation. There are metapelites on both sides of the Saint-François-de-Salle shear zone, which contain metamorphic index mineral indicative of low pressure metamorphism, such as andalusite or cordierite that uh, overgrow prismatic sillimanite. The exact relationship between shearing and metamorphism is difficult to assess because the sheared rocks are granitic platonic rocks, but in the context of the Grenville origin and given the age of shearing that I will show in the following slides, it's unlikely that pressure was much higher than 0.4 GPA during the formation unless there is a young and undocumented burial event that affected the area. Okay, now let's move on to the fun stuff. So this is a backscattered electron image of the entire thin section showing the ultramyelinite layer in the upper part. 
you can see the uh, metamorphic foliation of the protolith being deflected in the ultramyelinite. And again, consistent with the sinusoidal sense of shear. We used SEM EDS maps to identify titanite grains, which are highlighted in orange. And right away, you can see that they are much larger and more abundant in the ultramyelinite than in the low strain zones. There are also variations in morphology, orientation, um, and microstructure that are consistent with distinct crystallization processes. So on the left is an example of a titanite from the low strain zone. It's rare, small, randomly oriented, lobate, and it creams ilmenite. Laser ablation uranium lead data define the lower intercept of uh, 10, 16, plus or minus 11, and may, which is 60 million years younger than the crystallization age of the protolith. These textures and the age are consistent with the absence of igneous titanite in the sample, which is a good thing because it rules out the possible inheritance of zirconium content from high temperature uh, igneous titanite. These titanite grains are instead the product of a metamorphic reaction, which tends to occur at upper green schist to lower amphibolite facies. Now, here are titanite grains from the ultramyelinite. They're real beauties, really, really exciting. They're abundant, they're large, they're elongate, parallel to the foliation, sigmoidal, the, they are asymmetric magnetite wings, and we can see deformation twins in cross polarized light. The asymmetric microstructures are all consistent with a sinistral sense of shear, the same as a shear zone. So far, these grains really looked like they grew during shearing. <clears throat> if that's not enough, here are two EBSD maps of the grains shown on the left. In the top map, you can see crystallographic orientation rotate progressively uh, from the core to the tips of the grain by up to 15 degrees. The kernel average misorientation map at the bottom show that there's a high density of... Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, a high density of dislocation um, in the, uh, the bottom right uh, tip. So there, the dislocations are the thin white lines that you, see, that you can see in the grain. Uh, so these features indicate intense uh, intracrystalline distortion. So I hope that uh, by now you're all convinced that these features in titanite from the ultramyelinite are inconsistent with pre-shearing growth or post-shearing growth. So the option left is that titanite grew during shearing. And these titanite grains in, uh, in the ultramyelinite yield a lower intercept age of 1002 plus or minus 10 MA, which barely overlaps with the metamorphic titanite age within uncertainty, and we interpret this as the age of shearing. Okay, let's recap a bit. First, the temperature of shearing is relatively low, probably in the range of 400 to 500 degrees Celsius, and certainly no higher than 600 degrees Celsius. So you, re you recall the CS fabric and the extremely localized ultramyelinite layer. That's not something you would expect at high temperature. Second, the pressure during regional metamorphism, which likely predated the shearing, was lower than 0.4 GPA. And third, titanite in the ultramyelinite formed during shearing. Therefore, these titanite grains must have formed below 600 degrees Celsius and we can use them to test the zirconium and titanite thermometer below its calibration range. So there are several parameters in the thermometer equation shown here that must be constrained. Silicon activity is a no-brainer because there's plenty of quartz in the sample, and we set it to one. Titanium activity is a bit trickier because the rock doesn't contain rutal, but uh, it must, so it must be below one. But uh, there is ilmenite, and a lot of studies use a value of 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 of these type of rocks. Uh, so let's go with uh, 0 0.75 plus or minus uh, 0 0.25. We set the pressure at 0 0.3 plus or minus 0 0.2 GPA. 
And these trans these uh, uncertainties translate into temperature uncertainties of 19 and 22 degrees Celsius, while the calibration has an uncertainty of 20 degrees Celsius. The uncertainty on the zirconia measurements are considered negligible compared to variations in titanite zirconium concentration measured in the sample. If we add all these uncertainties in quadrature, it gives a uh, 35 degrees uncertainty that is displayed on the diagram on the right. So as you can see, uh, except for a few analysis with uh, real high zirconium concentrations that yield high temperatures in excess of 700 degrees Celsius, the vast majority of analysis yield temperatures that cluster around 675 degrees Celsius. So even if we consider the uh, 35 degrees Celsius uncertainty, this is way too high. So let's try the worst case scenario now, or the best case, depending on how you see it. We've modified the parameters to obtain the lowest temperature while staying within reasonable boundaries. We can't play with the silicon activity because quartz is abundant, so it's really well constrained at one. However, it's possible that the uh, titanium activity was overestimated. There is a nice study by Schiller and Finger who investigated a similar issue for uh, titanium and zircon thermometry. And he suggested that uh, in ilmenite bearing, rutile absent granites, titanium activity might be as low as 0 0.5. So let's use that as a minimum value. Finally, as I explained, we don't have a good control on the pressure during the formation, and maybe we underestimated it. But it doesn't matter because a higher pressure during the formation would result in higher titanite crystallization temperatures, and the temperatures are already too high. So instead, we'll use the lower, uh, the, the lowest pressure possible. 0.1 GPA. Because titanium activity and pressure are already at the lowest end of plausible values, I've removed their uncertainties and kept on the uncertainty of the thermometer calibration. So we're now looking at temperatures around 620 degrees Celsius at the lowest. It's, it's better, but it's still too high. Now I just don't know what to do to make it work, so I have to conclude that it doesn't. <laughs> In summary, titanite that formed below 600 degrees Celsius can contain high zirconium concentrations, leading to overestimated temperatures. This is a serious concern, because if you don't already know that your titanite crystallized below 600 degrees Celsius, you might think that they truly crystallize at 650 or 750 if they yield such results. In our samples, zirconium is not inherited from metingius or metamorphic precursor. And the uh, zirconium and titanite thermometer cannot be extrapolated to, uh, to titanite that's formed below the range of calibration temperature. So if you're using this thermometer, we strongly recommend to be very careful and most importantly, to only use it in conjunction with other thermometers and microstructural observations that point to a crystallization temperature above 600 degrees Celsius, where the thermometer could yield valid results. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if, uh, if we have a bit of time for that. So we've got plenty of time for some questions. Yeah. Um, uh, even the uh, titanite is completely reset uh, isotopically. I'm still not convinced that there's no inheritance of being the estimated more of it. Can you kind of highlight the evidence for that? OK, so I think the key point here is that titanite is not reset. It's new, it, it's new growth. So we, we see it best on that full thin section map. So if you, uh, I'll just bring the spotlight back. Yeah, so at the top here, you do see the largest titanite grains in that area. And these are the ones that I showed on the next slide. So the titanite grains that rim ilmenite, they're not even 100 microns across. 
And these are the largest grains from the, the entire 10 sections. And most titanite grains in the, uh, uh, in the low strain zone are even smaller than that. Whereas the titanite grains in the ultramyelinite can reach up to several uh, hundred microns wide. So this one is almost a millimeter long. So titanite was not present before shearing. In that, in that, in that case, can you tell us what the reaction is that's forming the titanite? Sorry? What about the reaction that's forming the titanite? <laughs> okay, that's, uh, that's a good question I don't have an answer for. It, it, yeah, titanite form mysteriously, I'd say, in the ultramyelinite. It's counterintuitive to have a mineral growth during shearing, while all the other minerals are completely recrystallized to a smaller size. But yeah, I, I don't see that as a precursor mineral from a mineral that was larger before, uh, yeah, before the formation, because it's just not present in the in the low strain zone. So one possibility is that it inherited zirconium content from minerals around it. But in that case, it, it still crystallizes with a higher zirconium content than you would expect at that temperature. So that could happen in the formed rocks or in non-deformed rocks. And it's still a problem with, the, with that thermometer. Yeah, thanks, Uno, and well done for getting up so early. <laughs> uh, no, um, I was wondering about the microstructures in the titanite and whether you've got any diffusion along the microstructures, which presumably would affect the ages as well. It doesn't seem to be, but whether you can have why the, if that could be having an effect on the zirconium. Uh, there, there might be effect. We didn't look into really fine grain detailed stuff. Uh, for the age, unfortunately, that's a Granvillian age titanite. So detecting age variations that are less than 20 million years is almost impossible with the uncertainties we have uh, with the laser. For zirconium content, uh, yeah, I don't know. We, we didn't do detailed zirconium maps, so I'm not sure if there are any variations related to that. But just from the laser spots, which are quite big, uh, it, it seemed to be fairly homogeneous, except for the, the, few, uh, the few points with really high, uh, really high content. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thanks for a very nice talk. Is it possible that the ultramyelinite developed in a different mythology? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you either go yes. closer to the microphone? Is it, possible, or... is it possible that the ultramyelinite developed in a different mythology? Uh, that would be very surprising because it re it's really, really thin. And on all the myelinites that we saw, they're rarely perfectly continuous um, in thickness. So you see the myelinite completely, well, the ultramyelinite either completely disappear or get really, really thin, like in that area here. So that would require an extremely fine dike that's continuous for, for meters and meters, and that would reach a thickness of, uh, of almost zero, so, or only one millimeter, so. It's difficult to exclude it completely, but it doesn't seem to be possible. <laughs>